Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today in the show, I'm joined by Ray Nasser, CEO of Arthur Mining. Arthur Mining is a Bitcoin mining firm teaming up with Brazilian energy markets to bring hash rate to the 12th largest market in the world. Ray, welcome to The Mining Pod. Thanks so much for taking the time. Bitcoin White Paper Day, it's a great day to record anything on Bitcoin, but it's also the day after the election in Brazil. So we have two different events happening at the same time, kind of a collision course, very, very different topics, right? But uh, it's good that we get to record on this day and kind of think about what both those things mean. But first of all, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm very good. Um, thanks, Will. It's, it's, it's both a pleasure and an honor to be here. It's double the honor because it is White Paper Day. You know, it is. It is. Time, every day, like you said, after the elections in Brazil, where people have chosen who will govern them for the next four years. You know, it's uh, it's actually a happy coincidence, right? The, the day you choose who's going to govern you, and the day where absolute freedom was found. Well, let's start off recollecting a little bit on your Bitcoin history, uh, just for everyone to get to know you a little bit more, since you've never been on the podcast yet. But you've been in Bitcoin for quite a while founded a mining company. You've been in the financial space for quite a while, even before that as well. Uh, a little backstory to go along with White Paper Day would be great to start off. Sure. So um, I graduated uh, from US college. I graduated from Babson College back in 2003, straight to the financial markets. Uh, I'm an economist. Um, so I worked for a couple of banks. Uh, I managed two hedge funds in New York uh, for over eight years. I you know, was there for all the 2008, 2009 mortgage crisis and market crisis, where really lived what happened in the market. I really analyzed what happened to banks, government, you know, the whole relationship between people who have power, people who don't have power. Um, obviously, really upset with the whole thing back in the time. But then I was introduced to Bitcoin mining in 2000, at the end of 2014, right? You know, as any person from the financial market, uh, you know, deeply skeptical, you know, people told me about oh, Bitcoin in 2014, you know, we all thought it was a scam at the beginning, of course, right? But then, you know, they showed me, okay, you don't need to like the asset, but you can mine this asset. You know, so so take a look at this this mining operation, which is a friend of mine had a mining operation, which I invested on. I was happy to invest um, in something to try it out. And, you know, there was a really good value creation, regardless of the asset, regardless of the underlying asset. I mean, you can dislike corn or oil, but you're always going to mine it and you're always going to sell it for dollars, right? You know, after a couple of months, I realized I was making six, seven, eight, nine percent a month which was really incredible. You know, back at the time, I stopped and stop it right there. Let's see. There's two things happening. What, 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 either of two things are happening here. Either this is a scam or Ponzi scheme. You know, it's too good to be true. Right? Or this is really something that people need to learn about. Uh, this is a really creation of value that the market that has not gotten a hold of yet. So there's a big information arbitrage here. Right? It was the latter. Thank God. Uh, I did my due diligence. I visited my field. Uh, you know, I learned about Bitcoin and I really began to love it. And in Bitcoin, I saw purpose for my own life. I said, this is what we're going to work with. This is, this is fairness. This is consensus. You know, there's no promises being made or the only promise is that the rules are going to be followed and the miners are the ones doing that. Right. Plus, there's an incredible creation of value unlike anything I have ever seen before. So I fell in love with Bitcoin mining. I started my own mining operations and I started, you know, one of the first companies in the world to allow investors to invest in Bitcoin. This is in 2015, right? Two years later, I had over 300 investors, very happy investors. And, you know, I would, I would buy, I would buy them hash rate. I would buy the machines. You know, they had the ownership of the machines. And I would pay them Bitcoin at the end of the, uh, every month after the expenses. And I would take a cut on that. Right. So that's when I really started mining Bitcoin. Um, ever since then, I set up Bitcoin mining operations in over five countries, you know, four continents. So Europe, China, South America, US, Canada, 
you know, everywhere we could go, we used to go, you know, obviously every two or three years, the whole mining uh, environment changed. At first, you're looking for a place where the law allows it. Then you're looking for a place for good logistics. Then after 2018, you start looking for a place for cheap energy. Right, because before, you know, when Bitcoin was going up, you didn't care about the energy. Just build, 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 deploy, deploy, deploy. And then when more efficient machines started coming online, you know, the whole business changed. So, you know, I've been doing this for, for the better part of, of eight years almost. Until, you know, we find it, we founded Arthur Mining in 2020 with one of my business partners. And let's go into Arthur Mining. An uh, interesting thing that you guys are doing is opening up the Brazilian market, which is uh, will probably take up the lion's share of this conversation because there's not a lot of miners in Brazil. You guys actually might be the first ones to deploy in mass there. Uh, but before getting into that, tell me a little bit about Arthur Mining. When you guys go and pitch it to investors or when you are at a dinner table, how do you pitch Arthur Mining? You guys have a bunch of mines in the United States. Do you guys have a lot of in-house knowledge from your time in mining? What else do you guys bring to the table? So... Arthur Mining came into existence for the need of a more institutional and high quality product, right? Before Arthur Mining, we were running operations for private investors, even institutional investors with the years, you know. Back in 2015, we could sell small, small packets of mining, $50,000, $100,000, you know. People would listen to us, would call us crazy. We started knocking on doors. 2017, they started to listen. You know, 2019, banks started to listen. Um, you know, not only, but we have banks as clients today and high net worth family offices and individuals. So we created Arthur Mining and said, you know, we want to create a company which we can take public in the future and we want to have people mining with us. And we also want to have and offer a lot of mining services. What Arthur, the Arthur Mining's first product back in 2020 was what we call private label mining with uh, people who can invest at least $1 million. We would run and manage the mining operation for them. We would buy the machines and we would post them in our own energy producing facilities. And, you know, we would pay them their Bitcoins mine, obviously. Then we started, we moved on to producing our own energy, which is flare gas energy, which is the gas that comes out of oil fields, methane gas, very harmful to the environment. So we adapted an existing technology where we capture this gas and we make it into clean energy, transform clean energy. And we use that energy to mine Bitcoin. Okay. Um, we are uh, sub two, less than two cents is our energy cost uh, per kilowatt hour. And uh, we can mine very, very, very efficiently with that. You know, we have also started building our own mining containers. We build them here in Brazil and then onboard our technologies onto the container and export it to the US for our own operations. That basically makes our cost 50%, 40% of what would be just purchasing a US based container. Okay. Um, then what happened <clears throat> as of October or November, about a year ago, okay, 2021, we started th this, just to be clear here, all operations are in the U.S., okay? And we're in the U.S. at that time. So we started getting calls from Brazilian oil and gas producers, Brazilian wind, Brazilian solar, uh, energy producers, big listed, publicly listed energy companies. You know, one, two, three, four, five calls a week, you know, for three, four weeks. All of a sudden, we're like, what are we missing here? Why are all these energy companies in Brazil suddenly interested in Bitcoin mining and mining Bitcoin, right? Up till then, and it's, st and it's still true now, Brazil is hell for Bitcoin miners, right? Why, why is that? Because you're going to import the mining machine in brazil is going to take a while because it's highly bureaucratic and it's going to cost you twice as much with if you pay all the taxes involved if you have no tax strategies right because everything you import in brazil costs at least twice as much so your payback is going to last take twice as long <clears throat> we also have one of the most expensive costs of energy in the world most of it is taxation right but we do have very, very, very expensive energy costs. So it would be suicide. We import the machines at double the cost and then consume very expensive energy here in Brazil. That's why we don't have Bitcoin miners in Brazil. You know, at least nobody doing it with scale. Sure, a couple of people have bought machines and brought it in. 
so they can, you know, talk about it in cocktail conversations or at weddings. Oh, I'm a Bitcoin miner. It's all so very nice, but nobody really has done it with scale. So, you know, if, if we reunite, if we reunite this concept, the comp- concept that the energy companies call us, we say, what are we missing here? Maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to mine Bitcoin in Brazil. And we found out that there is. So we created a product for energy mining, uh, Bitcoin mining in Brazil, which is basically using excess energy or unused energetic potential to mine Bitcoin here. So all the energy we're consuming here in Brazil comes at a zero cost. It's energy that would be wasted. A lot of, you know, there's an estimate that Brazilian solar, all the solar energy, which has had incentives to build, less than 20 of it can connect to the grid. Okay. All right. That's the estimate. That I heard. So of all that's being built, a lot of a lot of capacity is being built. The government they give incentives for the past two years. Okay. And there's a free energy market in Brazil. So um we plan to use all that excess energy to mine Bitcoin. It's excess energy. We also, you know, we also we have you know. MOUs are a few of the big listed energy companies that are mining Bitcoin with them. A lot of them have unused generators, which are just lying there, not being used. A lot of them um, have ramp up contracts where they sell to the energy grid every year a little more until they have, they can sell the whole capacity. We can mine Bitcoin and we're highly mobile. Our data centers are mobile. We we'll use it in containers, right? And if we're cleaning up the environment, if we're using flare gas, we can even generate carbon credits while we mine Bitcoin. You know, so it's a a big added value for us. We are also in talks with all the major landfills here in Brazil, major landfills provider. We can use, you know, biogas or biomethane coming out from these landfills in order to mine Bitcoin. So... You know, we can use renewable energy and renewable energetic potential to make a profit. Obviously, some of these energies, some of these companies are very afraid to have Bitcoin assets within their midst or or very afraid to be exposed to the price of Bitcoin. And we're showing that we can hedge the price exposure through the derivatives in the market. So, you know, this this is our main product here for Brazil. So for those keeping track at home, Brazil has less than 1% of hash rate according to Cambridge's numbers, which is pretty low for one of the largest economies in the world and somewhat shocking. But just to clarify what you're saying. We have no uh, hash rate, much less than 1%. Yeah. No hash rate yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah. In Brazil, you know, there's, there's mining in Argentina, there's mining in Paraguay, there's mining in Uruguay. Uh, there's no mining in Brazil. There's yeah. no mining. And it's because of one, the import tax, which would affect machines, and two, the high cost of energy. So let's break those two down. For machines, if you're importing any sort of industrial machinery, is maybe that's what it'd be classified as, or perhaps correct me, what would be the tax rate you'd have to face for importing machines from China or wherever you buy them from? 94 to, 94 to 105%. Wow. Okay. 105%. Um, Plus the bureaucracy, that's not it. I mean, yeah. take three months at a port, just stop at a port, that's three months of mining that you're missing. Yeah. So you have to pay basically double for an ASIC. And is there is there like a a growth of an inside Brazil for an ASIC market because of this? Is there any demand for them to start building chips inside Brazil? Or at this point, the Bitcoin mining industry has just sort no, of... No, we're not, we're not advanced in terms of building chips in Brazil. Mm-hmm. I mean, at Arthur Mining, we are we want to purchase some ch- chips to build ASICs. This is something mm-hmm. we're attempting to do. But and maybe in Brazil. Yeah, we're gonna build ASICs in Brazil, but all the parts has to come from have to come from yeah. outside. We don't Brazil's not a big chip maker. So you know we have to uh, get the parts from outside. Yeah, sure. We we do have conversations okay in, in order to do that, but we need to hook the energy companies first and, and they are hooked. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, my theory is that energy companies, utilities are going to be the biggest Bitcoin miners in the future. I think it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. I really think it's inevitable that this happens sooner or later. Um, So the sooner we get into this, the better, you know, um, there has been some political movement and efforts to take away the import taxes on some of these uh, agents. 
you know, but um, we haven't seen anything concrete signed as of yet. Obviously, we're going to a political turmoil stage. Uh, and now we have the World Cup and then we have the New Year's and then we had Carnival. So Brazil really starts its years going in April. let's let's turn to the energy side of the conversation as well uh interested to get a little more information about like what brazil's energy sources are the ones that you guys are tapping into how these deals are being structured uh maybe we can start with the first one what sort of energy sources are you guys finding in brazil that are suitable for bitcoin mining you mentioned methane i'm wondering if there's any hydro or you said excess solar brazil's huge right Brazil's one of the biggest countries in the world we have many different climates of many different areas so brazil has a lot of hydro now brazil has a lot of solar we have some wind we have natural gas as well okay and there's some coal as well but um we are looking at all the renewable sources of energy right so um there's a probably a big project coming in for us with the uh natural gas Okay, also, we're also looking at a project with solar energy in the north of Brazil. And something we're really, really pushing is biogas from landfills. Because there's a landfill, there's a lot of gas coming out. You can channel that gas and basically put a Bitcoin mining container right next to the landfill and make it mine. So th- these are all renewable sources of energy. We do believe that um, renewable energy is the best play for the long term. Okay, first of all, there may be some incentives. Second of all, there's there's financial incentives already from the Development Bank of Brazil to do this. And, you know, it's something that can last a long time. And uh, we're, we're not going to get into the political narrative turmoil that Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment. We can prove by our actions that this is just not true. Interesting. So I want to move into the Brazilian scene versus the Latin American scene itself, which I think a lot of people who you know, are not paying attention to Latin American markets might see like there's no distinction between the two of them, but there's a difference in language, there's a difference in culture. And to my understanding, there's also a difference in the economies. And we can see that with Bitcoin mining very clearly, where Brazil has no Bitcoin mining for all the reasons you've laid out. But Bitcoin mining has become a very popular industry in Paraguay, Argentina, uh, Venezuela has a Bitcoin mining scene. And we hear about it in different parts of Latin, right? We haven't really heard about it in Brazil. But from your angle as an expert on the topic, is there a fundamental difference between the two? Is it just the economies? Uh, Just because Brazil has more or less closed its borders to a lot of different industries because of these high rates? Or is our Bitcoin miners just sort of missing out on this opportunity? Uh, How do you, in general, see the the market there? All countries in Latin America are fairly um, protective of their economies. But first of all, and we're only talking about scalable or scale Bitcoin mining operations, okay? Brazil is a country where, better than most other Latin American countries, you can have the rule of law. You know, things can just be confiscated out of the blue. This is something that is very important. Okay, we, we, we we're pretty much developed uh, in that sense, which is a good thing. Uh, you can do good business in Brazil. All of Latin America is very bureaucratic. Okay, uh, um, this is this is a given, and every country has different political views. Every country has diff- different bureaucracies. Every country has a different way of doing business. So if you're not really inserted into that country, it's very hard for you to do any kind of business. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, we still have a lot of corruption in Latin America. We do have a lot of lobby, although like political lobby is illegal here. You know, we we still have a lot of it. Um, But, you know, if you want to scale something up and then actually, you know, take investor money, have investors write you checks, you're going to be sure that this is an operation where in a country where it can't be confiscated, where you don't need to do have a deal with the government, you know, necessarily like Venezuela. Venezuela used to arrest the Bitcoin miners and then the government would just uh, take uh, all the operations for themselves. Today in Venezuela, you mine Bitcoin, you're paying the government their share, you know, and I, and I don't mean taxes. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's very hard for you to go into a totalitarian regime and say, I'm going to mine Bitcoin here. If you don't have a deal with the government and, and, and you want to know that that government's going to be there for a long time, right? Yeah. Um, we've had issues mining China. Uh, we I left China 
much before the China ban. You know, because they say, okay, we need the energy for three months, shut down your substation, and we say, okay, yes, sir, what are we going to do? You know, there's no recourse for us to do that. You know, in the U.S., there's a rule of law. Not only a rule of law, it's completely legitimized. They just want to tax it, and, and that legitimizes it, which is a good thing, you know. Um, I really hope that Brazil will follow the same path you know, we'll remove a little bit of the taxes on these ASICs and we'll give us incentives to produce produce value. Moving to the U.S. market, was it very difficult for, for you all as Brazilian miners or Brazilians to move into the U.S. market? Because you, you've mentioned that moving into different countries can be tough, but was it hard to move into the U.S. itself? It was not hard to move into the U.S. at all. You know, um, obviously, some states are easier than others. Some states are pro-business. Other states, I would say, are anti-business. You know, yeah. Uh, Any in particular? uh, I'd rather not say here for the podcast, (laughs) but um, we've had problems in a couple of states. We try to moving in. You know, either they will make up a new license. That requires them, you know, uh, it's a total bullshit licenses. They just, they just want money. You know what I mean? We, we don't want to work with states like that. We want to work with people where we're really adding value to them. We're creating jobs. We are generating uh, revenue for specific cities, specific towns. This is what we want. You know, we don't want to get uh, caught in bureaucratic uh, red tape from a few states, either because of political reasons or, or, or whatever. You know, we, we were a long-term business. We like building long-term relationships. You know, and this is where we have found it pretty amicable doing business in the states that we are currently. Gotcha. Gotcha. So moving back to the Brazilian market, which you guys are pioneering to build in, how are you guys making the economics work, especially during a bear market? I'm assuming that you still have to pay the importation tax on all those ASICs. Maybe you guys just bite it. And then you can balance that by high, having a very low operational cost by you know having completely subsidized free energy. Is there anything else that goes into the ingredients to make the whole mining setup work? First of all, we need to work with people who do imports regularly, import machinery regularly. They have the best strategies to make importation. Second of all, we can assemble some of these machines here in Brazil. If we have, you know, we have the right context, we have the right pieces, we have the right people to do it, this will lower taxation significantly. Moreover, these machines, I mean, the energy cost is basically a zero. We have a slight operational cost. So the operation makes, it does make sense, you know, because it will help, it will help projects achieve their paybacks in a shorter period of time than they would normally. So you have a solar plant project, you have a hydroelectric project, you know, you put Bitcoin mining into that, finance the whole, the whole deal. You can achieve payback instead of, let's say, four years. You can achieve payback in three years. Yeah, it's certainly nice to get the capex paid off quicker. Uh, though I'm sure the importation taxes is sort of a kick in the stomach a little bit, especially right now. Question for you on the energy sources: When you're working with these energy brokers or with the energy providers in the space, what is that like? It's have you found it like there's a lot of cronies in the system or is it a pretty fair system where you guys don't have to worry a lot about some of like the negatives of working with so many counterparties? I, I've just heard so many horror stories within the United States about people finding really good situations and then ending up in a very bad spot because they trusted the wrong energy broker or they trusted the wrong energy provider. Uh, is the Brazilian scene worse? Is it better? Do you need a local to sort of help you out? How do you lay it out? We don't go through brokers. We we have a lot of contacts here in Brazil. Um, you know, I myself have a lot of contacts in Brazil. We talk directly with the companies that are producing and generating that energy. And, um, you know, we deploy our CapEx through a joint venture with that company, in agreement with that company. So it, it is not on-grid energy we are taking. We cannot possibly consume energy here in Brazil or take on-grid energy. We take energy that would be wasted or we take energy potential that would be wasted and uh, our goal is to establish joint venture with the energy generators see uh, um you know for example if we can you know we can give them 100 120 dollars megawatt hour here 
And that needs to compare with what they would sell to the grid or what they would sell to the free market, which would be much less. You know, so it needs to be on their interest as well. If all interests are met, then we don't need to blindly trust anybody. Awesome. Got it. So for the last part of the conversation, we'll move over to 2022 bear market and how you guys are strategizing. So 2021 saw explosive growth across all of the mining sector and maybe too much. We're already seeing like a lot of possible delistings for public miners. We're seeing some public miners reveal very bad financials, bankruptcies, and whatnot. I already know of a bunch of private miners who've already gone through this who are currently getting wiped out, selling ASICs for huge discounts, selling sites, selling energy contracts. How is it down in Latin America in the circles that you're running in? Is it very similar? Are the the sites too small to have to deal with this? Uh, What's your take on the bear market at this point? We we don't have companies of size here in Latin America that we have publicly listed companies in the US. Okay. Um, the way a lot of these publicly listed companies are managed is less than great, if you ask me. You know, people are very good at raising capital. People are very bullish on Bitcoin and whatnot. The story is beautiful. But how, what about what about treasury management? What about companies just kept Bitcoin in their balance and then leverage themselves with dollar funds? These Bitcoins were... You know, they were stuck and then they had to sell it forcibly at the cycle low. Now they had to sell machines, which caused the, the machine market to go way low. You know, um, let me ask you a question now. Um, you on October 28, uh, three days ago, you, you put here on Twitter status, you are considering adding mining stocks at these levels, but even strong teams are diluting shareholders to address balance hole weaknesses. Right, equity go burr, which is printing, right? Have you considered adding Bitcoin mining itself instead of just buying the stocks? Because you're buying the stock, you're also buying management. What if you build your own mining operation? You know, and this is one of the products that we are rolling out here in Arthur, not just for very high level institutional investors. We're also rolling this product out for smaller tickets now. This is what we're trying to have people have their own mining operations through us. Then, you know, the whole company cash flow will not affect them. Never consider this. This is a good uh, opportunity for the market. Yeah. Further decentralized hash rate, add more miners to the network. Yeah. No, I, I definitely think like the last few days with the core scientific news this morning with the Argo blockchain news, and then last month with Compute North's news, all of them either going to bankruptcy or filing chapter 11 or signaling that they might be headed there quite soon. Yeah. Makes it's it pretty pessimistic, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a problem, man, because this is a trap, right? If you have, a lot of capital being poured into your company. What are you going to do? You're going to spend it. A lot of these, a lot of these VC funds, you know, pre 2022, they were just worried about your burn rate. What's your burn rate? What's your burn rate? You know, how much cash are you burning? How much cash are you spending? The more cash you spend, the more we're going to invest in you. So many of these companies, they're not worried about the efficiency of their operations. They just worry about spending the cash and deploying, deploying, deploying. Now, if you just deploy one after the other and you don't worry about the efficiency, you know, the bill will come someday in, in a downturn of the market and markets have downturns, mar- markets have cycles. You're not efficient. You're going to get burnt. You know, the bigger you are, you know, the bigger you're going to get burnt. So, you know, good thing for us right now is that we're cash rich. So, and we're raising even more cash so we can purchase these machines that they're cheap, very, very cheap prices. And, and our payback is just much, much faster. We can put them in our energy, low energy environment, low energy cost environment, so we can mine. You know, the hardest part, of our challenge, Arthur Mining's challenge today is raising a lot of capital right now in order to do this. It's a big distress play. But, you know, in a bear market, people are afraid to invest capital. And Bitcoin mining is anti-cyclical. Totally anti-cyclical. This is why you know we have you know we have our work uh, cut out for us. No, it's definitely an interesting time to be purchasing A6. And I think the stronger teams should purchase them right now if they're able to pick out the good assets. As we sort of wrap up here, I, I want to get some thoughts on like where the cycle goes next over the next three to six months, if we can project even that far. 
So let's get a hash rate projection projection from you. Uh, we have two months left until the end of the year. Where do you think hash rate is going to be? We're hovering around two fifty nine exa hash as of right now. Do you think it'll be higher or lower, or maybe somewhere in between? We're going to be higher. There's no question about it. People have learned to harness cheap energy, and machine costs are just the machine is just so cheap. They're just so it doesn't matter. A lot of people even mining under the water. They're not making a daily or monthly profit, just accumulating as much Bitcoin as they can with cheap machine costs. Well, machine costs are this cheap, Asterix is going to continue to grow because, you know, people, people look at the difficulty of mining and the Bitcoin price. They have never looked at machine prices. Now machine prices are really making a difference. So I think this is going to continue to grow. This is definitely going to continue to grow. You know, I'd say firmly 3% a month to 5% a month. On average, okay. Um, new machines are coming out. More efficient machines are coming out. You know, it makes the older machines even cheaper. And uh, as for the Bitcoin cycle, Bitcoin has been shown it's considered as a risky investment by the financial community, not by us, by the financial community, by the markets. Okay, so risk assets like tech stocks and Bitcoin. Netflix and Facebook and Tesla, you know, they're, they're all in the same bucket as far as the investor is concerned. And uh, we, need, we need to see the Fed to stop raising rates or before the stop, not even the Fed stop, the market needs to predict when the Fed is going to stop. If there is a prediction of when the Fed's going to stop, the market is going to go up, even if the Fed has not stopped raising rates yet. Very important. Make a distinction that the expectancy, what the market expects is what moves prices, not what is actually happening. So when this is when this expected, you know, stop to, to quantitative tightening is gonna occur, this is where we're gonna see huge rallies in the crypto market, especially Bitcoin, because the fundamentals of Bitcoin have been getting better and better and better. And oh, we have reached the floor here. Market continue to go down the floor, is firm. You know, 70% of Bitcoin has not been sold in almost two years. So the floor is firm. It's just a matter of when the price of, of when the price is going up. So we are, you know, a lot of mining companies are desperate because they're going to bankruptcy. Arthur Mining is desperate because we won't invest much more right now. You know, we're doing everything we can to tell people how important it is to invest right now in Bitcoin mining. And then you have a cash generating machine for a long time. So what's uh, if I could pull a number from you as we close up here, what would be the number end of year for ExaHash on the Bitcoin network? End of year ExaHash. We are November 1st. We have two more months. Ooh, well, what do you say? We're at 250 right now. So Yeah, hovering around 250. Two... Six, 265 to 280, I would say. Okay. 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 We're, we're, pretty we're, good. we're still going up. We're still going up. Obviously, you know, if, you know, if, if, if Argo or, or, or Northern uh, Data decides to shut off all their machines, then we're basically mm-hmm. going to stay where we are, maybe a little bit lower. But if the market yeah. is the way it is, you know, we can, we can go up to 280, I think. Perfect. Well, we got a number from you. It's it's pretty high, like 265. I think the highest I've heard so far, the most bullish was 300. I don't know if we're going to hit 300 quite quite this year. But Ray, thank you so much for joining us on the Mining Pod. It was great to get all the information about the Brazilian mining market, how you guys are opening up. Hopefully, we can do another take in about a year or so and hear about large deployments happening in Brazil. I would love that. I would love that. And uh, have, you come, have you come and visit? Visit our beautiful cities, our beautiful beaches and in the future, beautiful wine operations. Oh, I'd love to do that. I'll take you up on it sometime. Thank you again. Thank you, Will. <laughs>